Okay, good morning. My name is Henry Ngo, and I'm a PhD student here at Caltech, working with Heather Knudsen on the Friends of Hot Jupiter survey. So our goal is to look for stellar companions around known hot Jupiter uh, hosts. And uh, the question we're trying to answer is whether there's a, there's a correlation between stellar companions and hot Jupiters on misaligned or eccentric orbits. <laughs> so I do this uh, using NERC 2 ao in the infrared. And uh, on the left, I show my favorite system, HAT-P10, also known as WAPS-11. And it has a companion at around 0.3 arc seconds or 40 AU projected separation. Uh, in order to distinguish between a line of sight companion, uh, so a line of sight background object and an actually physically bound companion, we have a two year baseline shown on the right where I plot the separation and position angle of the companion over time. Uh, the points show our actual measurements and the, the tracks show uh, where the object would be if it was a background object. So here, well, hat P10 is clearly a physically bound companion, which I'm really happy about. So on the next slide, uh, I plot the companions that we did find in our survey. We found companions around 18 out of 50 targets, and the plot shows the mass ratio of the companion versus the projected separation. The different colors sh show the subset of our samples, uh, whether or not the hot Jupiter is on a misaligned orbit or, or if it's on a well-aligned orbit. So as you can see, it doesn't seem like there's any correlation at all between uh, the presence of a companion and uh, hot Jupiter, the, hot, the orbit of the hot Jupiter. So if you're interested, I would love to talk to you more about this during this week, and there's also a paper coming out soon, so look out for that. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ji Wang. I'm a postdoc at Yale University. Um, I'm interested in, uh, so radio velocity survey shows that um, the hot Jupiter occurrence rate is about 1% while Kepler gives this value to be 0.5%. So there is a factor of two difference. My work focused on how to reconcile the discrepancies. Uh, many people think that this is due to the uh, stellar metallicity, because metallicity plays an important role in forming hot Jupiters. Um, but recent study shows that uh, the metallicity so cannot um, explain the difference, solely explain the difference. So I'm thinking about maybe there are another factors explaining the difference. Um, think, I'm thinking about the stellar multiplicities. The uh, idea is that uh, Kepler's cannot distinguish between single stars and multiple stars. And because of the presence of uh, stellar companions, many hot Jupiters may be missed or misidentified as smaller uh, planet candidate. Therefore, uh, the planet occurrence rate from Kepler underestimate the hot Jupiter's occurrence rate. So um, my work is to see uh, to show how many fractions, what is the fraction of uh, hot Jupiters are missed or misidentified. And uh, um, this is the, the work. If you're interested in uh, more details about this work, please come to me. And my poster is at uh, number 34. Thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Kate Follett. I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona. And I want to tell you guys a little bit about a survey that we just started in May um, with Magellan AO called the Giant Accreting Protoplanet Survey, Gap Planets. Um, it's a survey of all of the Southern Hemisphere natural guide star accessible transition disks at visible wavelengths looking for accreting protoplanets. Um, and we've had remarkably good luck, so we're already 60% done with 85% of our targets allocated. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I think it highlights kind of why this is a, a great sample to play a little trick with high contrast imaging in the sense that transition disks are kind of this sweet spot because a lot of them are still accreting, so there's material flowing through their gaps. Um, and so if you can image them at H alpha, you can play a game um, where essentially their accretion luminosity bumps up the contrast so that we can do the kinds of scales that you'll see with next generation AO systems 
um, and space-based missions, but today. So this is a companion that we imaged in the transition disk HD142527. Um, and it's at just 86 milli arc seconds, which is 12 AU. So this is a game where we can image things on almost solar system scales um, now. So if you think that your favorite transition disk is missing from that list um, on the first page, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, if you want to hear more about this, um, my poster is number 15. And um, I'm here, Jared Mails is here, uh, Yalin Wu is here, and we still have Magellaneo stickers. So poster number 15. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan Bedell, um, and I'd like to tell you about a completely different way of getting at the properties of protoplanetary disks. So as you may know, for sun-like main sequence stars, we can regard the photosphere of the star as a kind of fossil record of the disk composition, because gas accreted from the disk uh, remains in the stellar convective zone for a long time. This means that by doing a spectroscopic chemical analysis of a planet hosting star, we can uh, learn about the composition of the disk out of which the planet formed. And we can get the highest possible precision on these chemical abundances by using solar twin stars, or stars whose fundamental properties of effective temperature, surface gravity, and metallicity are nearly identical to the sun. So Jorge Melendez did um, a small survey of solar twins and found a really interesting trend that the sun appears to have depletion in refractory elements correlating with the expected condensation temperature of those elements in the protoplanetary disk. This is really exciting because one possible interpretation could even be um, signs of past terrestrial planet formation seen in the sun. So on the next slide, uh, we're motivated by uh, these unique properties of solar twins. We have an ongoing <laughs> radio velocity planet survey, um, a large-scale program on the HARP spectrograph looking at solar twins. We're currently working on characterizing the planets around our sample. Uh, there's an example super-Earth uh, candidate shown here, and also doing high-precision abundance analyses of the whole sample. So by the end of our radio velocity planet survey late next year, we should have some really exciting results looking at um, correlations between stellar abundance and planet presence at a whole new level of precision. Please stop by my poster or talk to me if you want more information. Hello, um, I'm Tiffany Meshkot. I'm a PhD student at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And um, I've been working on two surveys using the appetizing phase plate coronagraph on NACO at the VLT. Uh, and what you see here on the right are just some examples of the kinds of sensitivities we're reaching. And uh, the goal of these projects obviously was to look for planets. <laughs> but additionally, uh, we wanted to see if we could find signposts for planets. And this kind of comes back to the question that we had earlier about whether debris disks are good uh, uh, types of systems to look for planets. Uh, we wanted to see if we could find uh, planets around uh, two-component debris disks. And uh, we think that they actually are very good candidates uh, because uh, two planets have been detected as part of this survey. So one is uh, HD95086. This was detected by Julian Rameau and the IPAG team. Uh, and the other is uh, HD106906, and this was detected by Vanessa Bailey. And, uh, and uh, this project, these two projects are, are uh, going to be completed soon. Um, I'm just finishing up the disk properties and the expected detection rate. But you should expect to see these papers out relatively soon. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Katja Poppenhager. I'm a Sagan Fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And what I work on is X rays transit observations of hot Jupiters. So, why would you want to work in X rays when you deal with exoplanets? The reason is that short wavelength photons, like the UV or X rays, are absorbed high up in the exoplanetary atmosphere. So, um, when you look at um, X ray transits, you expect a much deeper transit in X rays than uh, in the optical, for example, if you have an inflated atmosphere and you can measure the extent of the atmosphere like that. And we have recently done this, these kinds of observations, for two hot Jupiter systems that are transiting. This one is HD189733 
And um, what I'm showing you here is the uh, X-ray image of the whole star and a single X-ray light curve with a transit in the middle. And what you can see is there's some small scale variability, but we have a fairly constant stellar emission level, which is good. And so adding up several of these transit observations, we can hopefully detect the transit signal of the planet. On the other hand, we have here Kuro 2, and this one is a very active host star. It's uh, intrinsically about 10 times brighter in X-rays than the other one, but it's quite a bit farther away, so we're dealing with lower cow traits, and that's why we have lower time resolution. And something we noticed early on in the analysis is that we have here a lot of stellar intrinsic variability. We have lots of strong flares that might actually interfere with our transit detection. So the question is, can we do this? Can we see the transits? May I have the next slide? And the answer is yes, actually. For the uh, moderately active host star here, we can detect the transit signal in X-rays, and it's significantly deeper than the optical transit, which gives us an idea to how far the atmosphere is actually extended and what the densities are there. But in the other case, where we have this very active host star, we are completely uh, overrun, basically, by the stellar intrinsic variability here, and the transit signal is effectively masked here. So we've learned the very important lesson here, that we should be targeting moderately active host stars for these kind of studies to work around the stellar variability problem. And I can happily announce quickly that we have uh, recently completed a pilot study in X-rays of GJ1214b, which has a transiting super-Earth. Thank you.